Good. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, mm. We're going to come before the Lord and open in prayer, and then we'll make a start. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity of being together once again. We thank you, Lord, for your word and truth, and we just pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. Most importantly, Lord, as we grow in our knowledge of your word, we pray that you'll help us to apply it in our lives, that daily we'll walk in that truth that we read together and that we grow in. So we just commit ourselves to you, Lord, today. We just want to pray today for Paolo, who mm. had to go to hospital. We just pray for him and commit him to you. And just thank you, Lord, for our, our fellowship and our church. We also continue to pray for, for Henry and Margaret, and we thank you for them. And we just commit today into your care, praying your blessing upon everything said and done. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Good. Yeah, he's okay. He's okay. So we're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to just read from verse 12 to 28. As we conclude with 1 Thessalonians. And as I said, next week we continue with 2 Thessalonians. Which is good. Yeah. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Good. So Amen. if we look at, at verse 12 and 13, uh, as Paul concludes this epistle, we have to remember that what we're dealing with here with Thessalonians is one of the earliest epistles written. So our concept of church, where there are pastors and leaders in the church, the church is being shaped. I mean, I don't even think that they've got a constitution. There's no membership role or anything like this. It's all new. So, so certain men are chosen. Um, but also wouldn't probably go through a formal vote as we have. It would be the apostles. And others who are recognized who will step into that leadership position. But it is important as we start the process of church and what will be for the next 2,000 years that Paul encourages the congregation to recognize those who labor among you. Now, this is very important. Why? Not of the person, not the person who's the minister or the elder, because it does speak collectively. Yes. So we'll speak about an eldership or whatever you want mm. to deal with it, depending on the size of the church. It's not dealing with the person. It's about the office that is important. Because God has appointed the office of pastor, of elder, of minister for a very specific purpose. Once trust in that office starts um, being affected, once there's an issue, that really affects the whole body. And we've seen this everywhere. So when mm -hmm. a minister has to leave and it's difficult circumstances... Yeah. Um, it really affects the whole body. And therefore, it's important that churches appoint the right person, that the people mm -hmm. then, when that person is appointed, is respected for that position. Yeah. If they're not the right person, you shouldn't have appointed them. Mm -hmm. The problem just is who appoints? <laughs> Who's equipped to yeah. appoint? Yeah. Now, I've been part of the whole process often, and many, many instances when I... I've been to interviews and have to deal with that. Very rarely do you get asked theological questions. And I find that odd. Hmm. 
Like they won't ask you, what is your view on this? Or what about this? Or what about that? No. And then what happens is it's okay. The guy's a nice guy. Yeah. He's got a good resume. Now for me here at Mother Baptist Church, it was slightly different because I'd known the church for a long, long time. That's different. But when you just appoint someone to come over and like, okay, we're going to have an interview. And then they ought to mm. preach to a view. The guy's going to preach one sermon. Yeah. It's this odd setup. Yeah. It really, really is. I don't know what the answer is, but all I'm saying is that when a church has to appoint a new minister, you need to have equipped people oh. to appoint that person. And then when that person is appointed, the congregation needs to respond and understand that this office is yeah. important. When that person fulfills their calling, it will be the dynamism within the church. If that person does not fulfill that calling, it's a big, big problem. Yeah. Now, the church is not dependent upon the minister to function, per se, because the church body needs to function on its own. But the issue is that the minister is important. And then what Paul is encouraging here is, therefore, it says here in verse 12, that you, I urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor, to acknowledge their, their position, that are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. So there needs to be admonishment. So if people go to church and they don't like that the sermon you feel told off in the sermon. That is the job of the minister because when he's telling the congregation off, he's telling all of us off, yeah. which includes him who's preaching. It's about the body. So if you want to go to church and only hear nice and flowery things, yeah. that's fine. You can go to the church down the road where the guy looks like he's rolled out of bed and doesn't really worry about how he looks and stuff. And they don't read the Bible. So the reality is that when we go to church, it is about being encouraged. Yes, it's about being admonished. It's about really considering our Christian lives. Because the reality is that every single Christian, whether minister or not, we are not always where we're supposed to be because we live in this world. And I was speaking to someone in the week where I just said that it's really difficult for Christians to battle. Because the battle's for the mind. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it 200 years ago, and you're saying 200 years ago, there's a battle for the mind. They didn't have TV. They didn't have the internet. So there was struggles. But today, it's a real, real struggle. So to keep people focused is a big mm. job. There's so many other things that can consume our time. Mm. So it's important that we encourage. Oh, yes. you, know, you know, it's interesting on this. Um, you know, I, I certainly agree with... Um, you know, like you made the comment about being told off by the ministers and that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we have to be submissive in that and sort of recognize. Um, but the, but the, you know, I've been, I've been in churches where the, the minister kind of uses the sermon to tell someone off. <laughs> yeah. so you're not talking about that, are you? No. No, you know what I'm saying? You, well, some, you, people, some people use prayer to do that. Yeah, I've yeah, been in yeah, prayer meetings, yeah. but I know there's issues between people. Oh, Lord, sort these people out that are doing this. They're like, talking about the person across from. Yeah, so you don't use that. No, 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 I wanted to make that clear no, because, it, you know, I was. No, what it is, it. is when we look at the scriptures, yeah, yeah. there's a and drive forward for us to be yeah, really focused. Yeah. It's not using the pulpit to tell people, I agree, and neither prayer. Yeah, yes, no, it's been all no, 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 but, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, I remember you telling, and I thought it was really powerful for me when you said that about uh, you get situations where uh, a couple they're having big difficulties, and you you say, first of all, you get them to look at the word, yes, you yes, know, yes, and, yes, and that's the one, you know, and this is but you do it, you do it though, it's them two together, not in front no, of the no, no. and it's you know. and it's God that speaks. And I think yeah. that's the key thing, that if you feel convicted, it must be through the word. Because the mm -hmm. word convicts us. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but... but yeah, okay, I'll yeah. tell you what, with my experience at Stoke Pines, you see, yeah. in a free church, well, there's a few dissenters there that actually told me. Oh, really? During that, well, that's not my... That's not what the Bible says. <laughs> that's awkward. I don't want Different that. theology, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, yeah. But I most of them went with it. So when we look at verse 12, it's recognize those who labor among you and are over you and admonish you. So there needs to be that recognition of the office. Yeah. And then verse 13 says, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And what is that work? The problem is that if, if we look at the office of elder and ministers or those who labor, this is not just talking about the 
the pastor. It's talking about all those who labor among us. But what is that labor? The labor here that's in focus here is not specifically doing practical things, although that is important. But the labor here is what is the primary purpose for why we come to church? Mm. What is the primary purpose of church? Is for spiritual growth. Mm. The church is not a club where I've got nothing else to do with my week and therefore I go on a Sunday because it's my entertainment. And people think like that, like, oh, church is part of my, you know, I've got this, I've got knitting, and I've got this club and that club, and then Sunday I go to church. That's not what this is talking about. If that is your mindset, you're going to be very disillusioned when there's nothing happening at church, because church is not supposed to be about happenings. It should be a place where we're growing in our knowledge of the Lord. Now, does it mean we don't do practical things? Does it mean we don't have fellowship? We must have those things, 100%, but it's not the primary for why we come to church. The primary of why we come into church is to grow in the Lord and to encourage God's people to grow accordingly. And that's why verse 13 is important. We esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. What is that work? The work of sharing the word of God. And the problem is in churches mm. today, we have far too many people in, in elderships who are not equipped to teach. They're just hanging mm. around because they're good in business. Yeah. Oh, he's right. And literally, uh, your church is completely run by you've got a minister, he preaches, the rest of us have all achieved something in business, we are really seeing people, we've been voted in, and literally, all it is, it's a business meeting. But they're not equipped to teach the word. That is not the office of an elder. Now, there are elders who might not be as equipped to preach, but if you want to be an elder, you must teach the word. That's your purpose. Your purpose is not to be a director of a company that is not the church you are not on a board now yes you can have practical ministries in the church and people can be practically involved like trustees and all these type of things but that's not eldership the biblical picture of an elder is someone that spiritually takes responsibility for people i said the same for those who want to run para ministries where they're not really they're running a home group or they're not actually part of some church. They're doing their own thing. It's fine if you do your own thing, but you must take responsibility pastorally for the people that you care for. Yeah. And therefore, it's not just if, if it's a collective leadership of more than one elder. It's everyone's responsibility to be spiritually focused on the well-being of God's people. That is the primary purpose of spiritual leadership. There are other levels, and those people can be involved. But if you want to step into the position of calling yourself an elder, then you take spiritual responsibility. I don't want to hear from elders. I'm not really into the Bible. Yeah. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear I don't pray with people. Yeah. I don't want to hear that I'm not willing to run a small group. Yeah. That then you're not put for the office of an elder specifically, because the key to an elder is spiritual oversight and taking responsibility. And that's what verse 13 specifically talks about here. Yeah? Well, that's their work's sake. It's, it's, it, that's the work that they do as, as spiritual leaders and be at peace among themselves. So it's just encouraging. Now, remember, this is not about pitching for a minister or telling everyone now to make sure that when the minister comes in, the red carpet's rolled out and the limo's <laughs> in the front and everyone just thinks that he's the best thing since sliced bread. It's not what it's talking about. It's just saying, remember where we are at in the New Testament. Churches haven't really been shaped and formed yeah. like we understand them. This is the beginning. So, so how long was it with Paul at Thessalonica? Um, do we know? I, you might be. I just don't know. Uh, no, I think but normally he was there yeah. at least for a year, yeah, a yeah. more than a year. He would spend that time, come back. So he was building something yeah, to yeah. what we more structured to what we know. And this is why he's encouraging this. Um, I mean, then if, yeah. in Acts chapter 20, already have the Ephesian elders praying with That's Paul right. and Paul praying with them. So yes, but the formalities of what we now understand, because remember, Timothy hasn't been written. Titus no. hasn't been written. So what? Wow. So how do you know? Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. things are all being revealed because this is early on. Yeah, yeah. Because because um, technically, Timothy and Titus, they're not apostles per se, are they? No, no, no. no. They, they pass Whereas, so, you, so with Paul still here, you, you there's an element to which it's kind of like in a transition still because, because you clearly, they are apostles. You know they're apostles because of things. And that, they then, so the congregation recognizes no, someone, but yeah. the apostle confirms that. 
very often. It's not like a ballot yeah, no, voting no, process, no. like what we have no. today. Per se. So yeah, so it's important to recognize that. Verse 14 then says, we now exhort you, brethren, warn those. So here we go to the, something a bit more closer to home for us. We exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. Now, this is important. So the, the pastor is responsible for the general mm -hmm. oversight of caring for God's people. But now he shifts it to saying to the congregation, they must understand the responsibilities within the body that is very, very important. So here it's, it's saying, warn those who are unruly. So it's not just the pastor's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, what does unruly mean, really? So um, I just looked at the word. So basically, it's those who are out of order. Unruly. Now, again, it's difficult. I wouldn't want to give examples. I don't know specifically what the context might have been there. Because I don't like this concept within the church that if someone doesn't agree with what the pastor is preaching or someone doesn't agree with what the church is doing, now suddenly they are unruly. Yeah. That's not what it's yeah. saying. Because you're allowed to disagree. You're allowed to respectfully con converse with the pastor and say, I disagree with this or I disagree with that. It doesn't mean you're unruly. But what it's specifically speaking about here is an issue within the church where the person is destructive within the church and also destructive outside. Mm. So there are people, now again, not for us, we are, you know, good people. But sometimes a church is someone that's causing problems outside the church and then causing problems in the church, and they need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. and, and do you know what, Ken, Kenny and I both know someone, you know, that is that this just describes, doesn't it, Ken? Sure. Yeah. Um, there are people that, that are, is the problem, isn't it? So that's why we don't really have anything no. to do. I mean, there are unruly people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in a sense, I get, I don't know if it's correct, but when I read this, it's kind of those with a sort of non submissive heart. So, like, so, you know, you can't really. Yeah. But it depends on what that looks like because it needs to be submission to God's word. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you have to be submissive no. to the minister. Sure. That's what it's saying. No, no, it's just no. people that are spiritually not focused. And they are causing destructive, they, 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 destructive behavior that's part of their lives. They're causing destruction in the lives of others. That's they're right. causing destruction, destructive, they have a destructive nature outside in the testimony in the community. And, and they need to be dealt with. But what's the first process here? Yeah. It's not it's calling them to a church no. council. It's what are we doing in the pew, first and foremost? Yeah. That's the mm -hmm. conversation there. Are we speaking to them saying, what's happening? Let's talk about it. Not, not about yeah, yeah. just saying what's happening. But you know what happens generally in church? When there's an issue, the congregation runs. They go yeah. to the shelters and go on holiday for a week. <laughs> and guess who has to deal with it? Minister. The minister and the trustees or that they need to deal with it because no one touches this in church. And no. that's not the biblical mandate. This no. is your church. Whatever church, you, it's your church. Yeah, yeah. You need to take responsibility for it as well. It's not just, oh, well, let's get the teacher involved here because we don't want to touch this. No, no. All of us need to deal with it. I mean, when I was saying non-submissive heart, it was more the sense that, because it's not we're not saying everyone has to agree with what we're saying, or you know, no. but it's more that, okay, so we don't agree on that, but let's kind of like, okay, agree to disagree. It's that heart of yeah. sort of working on and working together yeah. Agree to disagree or leave. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, it? You know. That's fine. Can, mm. that's can, it. can I just ask? I'm just wondering here. Um, he's talking to the Thessalonians, who are mostly um, the Greek of Greek culture. It would have been. It would have been, Gentiles, The church would have been a mix, but mostly Gentiles. Gentiles, mostly Gentiles. Gentiles yeah. of Greek yes. culture. Yes. I'm wondering. Um, if he's trying to bring them into a kind of ethos, which from his experience would have been a more Jewish ethos, yes. um, but you know, from his background, yeah. obviously. Uh, whereas theirs would have been somewhat pagan and Spot on. But they would have had a very different. Yeah. So, what Miriam what Miriam's saying, so I want to repeat the question. What Miriam's saying is very good that basically what's happening is that the Thessalonians come from a Greek culture where they are slightly more unruly and not understanding certain dynamics, where Paul is right. sharing with 
them slightly more of a Jewish understanding when it comes to God and the structure and the things that need to happen oh, within, yeah. within that worship process. And relationships. Yes, and relationships. So, yeah, that's very good. I think that's very important because we have to acknowledge that although the church is separate from Israel, God has already set a tone in the Old Testament of certain things that the Greeks wouldn't have known. So that's very, very good. But it is Kenneth, key- Kenneth in, my, in our Bible, it says, um, warn those that are idle rather than unruly. Yeah. It means many things. It can be unruly. It can be idle. It can be, there's a list of four or five Greek words. All right. So I'm not going to just base it on one word. There. No, no. So basically it's just people that are not, let's say they're, they're causing problems in the church, outside the church. They are not working. They are just not good for anything at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's <clears throat> this issue. It is an issue, mm-hmm. but there are several words that are being used there. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. So that's why I said that out of order in the church or even in life outside, which will then constitute people that, that also are, don't want to work and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Kenneth, it's Sue here. Presumably, hi, hi um, presumably um, a woman wouldn't be expected to um, uh, admonish um, a fellow believer who was a man in this situation. Would that be fair to say or not? Depends on the culture and how they would speak. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the I, reason I, I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on Greek culture and what the yeah. relations would be, but, but I think it'd I mean, be different today. But, I mean, Miriam's just brought um, up the very interesting point that, um, you know, this, the tone is set in the Old Testament, and mm. there, were, there was an order of things among the Hebrew people, and mm. women weren't expected to teach men, and, and were more sub- yeah. subordinate to men. 100%, but it doesn't mean that women can't share the truth of an issue. No. Right. So the guy is, the guy's been unfaithful to his wife, or guys doing. A woman can say to him, "I don't believe that's right." That doesn't mean you're not right. submissive. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Except, so you would hope that men can step in, but it doesn't mean that women can't share the truth. Okay. And uh, it, what's what's significant is the fact that again, it's it's the position of teacher, but it doesn't mean that people didn't speak to each other. No. Yeah. Because you can always refer to the Word of God. So the key there is that the word of God sets the tone in, in, right. in various aspects of the church. Then also it goes yeah. on to say those comfort the faint hearted. Now remember in the beginning of the epistle, they were being persecuted. And this is almost connecting to Timothy. Because Timothy was more faint hearted. Paul had to constantly encourage him to stand firm and stand for the truth because his personality was such to want to move away from conflict for the gospel's sake. Titus was different. Titus wanted to get into the ring. He Timothy, was your Roy Keane. He was Roy Keane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Timothy wanted to run away. So, so here we're saying comfort the faint heart. Those who are being persecuted and struggling with the conflict that comes. And it's not a, it's not a criticism. It's just the reality. Some people don't like the conflict. Mm. And then cower from that conflict. What the body needs to do is encourage them and say, mm. we here for you, encourage those who are feeling sort of fearful of the future, fearful of conflict that could come. So that's, that's what that means. Mm. They need encouragement to continue and to stand firm and to be with them. That, that you as a believer will stand with them. So that's important. Also, it says uphold the weak. Now, the weak there, again, is weary. It's not, it's not um, just, you know, they just always just weak physically, but it's because spiritually they've been, you know, maybe afraid, they've been downtrodden, and then they become spiritually weak where whatever that might look like, but they, they maybe want to go back to the world. They maybe want to not continue. Um, so... That's sort of part of that process. So in the fellowship, we need to encourage those who might be struggling spiritually, whether they don't want to keep going or others who might feel, I just just want to run away from this. Whatever Mm -hmm. shape or form, they need to be encouraged. They need to be cared for. So those who are in persecution need to be encouraged because they're struggling with that, but also those who are weak spiritually or personally, whatever, need that support from more mature believers, as I said in the notes. And then also, um, 
The last one is be patient with all. So whatever shape people are in, be patient with mm. them. So even the person that is, you know, unruly, whatever shape or form that's in, be, mm. encourage them and be patient with them. And with all people in the church, but we need to have the conversation. People generally don't have the conversation. Mm. So the people need to be encouraged. You know, get, get things back on track. If you are being yeah. unruly or idle, or whatever, get things back on track. We'll be here for you, but let's get it back on track. Deal with them. Same with those who are feeling yeah. oh, just difficult facing all these conflicts the whole time. Encourage them. And then yeah. the others who are, are showing signs of weakness. Be there with them yeah. and then be patient with everyone. Patience is the key one mm. for all of us because that's the one we, we struggle with. We expect people, we've spoken to them once, they need to come right now. Yeah. 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 That's how people so, think. Stop <laughs> looking at me. Yeah, so yeah. I speak to you once. That's not how you do I mean, you can't do that with a child. You don't do that with a child. You don't tell a child once and expect them now to always get it right. It doesn't no, work like that. Yeah, <laughs> and things to get it right. So, um, three times. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so then in verse 15, it says then, also continues, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for both yourselves and for all. So important is that the Christian believer, and Paul yeah. is encouraging the church, you're being persecuted, what should your response yeah. be? In, this, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of government pressure, whatever it might yeah. be, our response is not to retaliate. Yeah. Our most outside Judeo-Christian values, it won't be, wouldn't it? It yeah. would be revenge or, you know. I think even within the Judea, even, even within the Judea, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I mean, our natural instinct, I mean, I know from speaking for myself, when someone's done wrong to me, it, it, it's Ooh. your natural instinct, you want to get back at them. Now, you have to, I have to restrain myself from sort of having that attitude, that spirit, and it's not easy. 100%. You know. But the key here is that how should the Christian respond to things from the outside through criticism or whatever. It's not by physically retaliating. It's not mm. by wanting to do the other person in. And yeah, the funny thing is, with mm. our children, we, we encourage them to stand up for themselves. Yeah. Really. There's nothing wrong with standing up for no, yourself. No, no, but this is... So what's important, yeah. Adam, is if, if someone does yeah. and you stand up for yourself, it's not retaliate. No. Because we're talking about words here. Yeah, what yeah, I'm talking yeah. about is that we're not going to go blow up Parliament. No, no, no. Or you're not going to go and fight physical fisticuffs outside the road, outside on the road. You're not going to do things, Ill illegal things now in retaliation to what's been done yeah. to you. But to stand up and use words. See, words don't hurt. And I mean that in a general sense. Words are not like weapons. The world's made it like, oh, you can't insult the person because you're really going to hurt them and not going to be able to. I'm not sure. that physically. Hurt. No, but, but you can. If you say to someone you are wrong because of God's word, you can say that. That's not retaliation. Mm. No, no. That's preaching it out. But what I'm talking about, what Paul's talking about is the people don't know, should they be like zealots? Because what's happening is when the Roman soldiers want to fight with us and we get arrested, do we fight back? Do we cut off ears? You know, that type of physical yeah. violence is what he's saying. Don't do that. And also don't want, don't speak curses over people yeah. type of thing. It is basically understanding where they're coming from. But if he's coming in, your, you can preach. Jesus said the same. When a guy hit him, he said, why are you hitting me? Yeah. It's words you can use. Mm -hmm. But it's just that physical retaliation we have to be careful of. Because that creates, so what you don't never want to do, this is so important, is when someone hurts you, you mustn't sin in return. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing, because you can't justify sin. Now, again, there's a lot of circumstances to that. If someone breaks into your house and wants to kill you and kill your family, biblically, you can respond and defend yourself. Mm. That's a biblical principle. Mm. So it's not saying, oh, I'm sorry. Just, yeah, just that's not what it's saying. Yeah. That's not retaliation. Retaliation is a calculated effort. Yeah. To hurt someone else because they've hurt you. You can't have that spirit in the church. You can't have that spirit within the Christian. That's not good. All right. And then verse 16 goes on. Rejoice always. So the two things here are connected. 
Rejoice all always. God wants his people to be joyful. Mm. In every circumstance, be joyful. And it's difficult because it's not talking about happiness yet, as I said in the notes. Being joyful doesn't mean you're always happy. Like, I get very awkward with people that are always happy no matter what the circumstance. Yeah. I'm like, but that's not normal. Yeah. And I think, well, because I'm a Christian, I must always be smiley. You look like someone that smiles when stuck on. And it's awkward. You must be sincere. And sincere means I'm sincerely upset about this issue, but I'm still joyful. Yeah. yeah. A lack of joy means you become despondent. Mm. And there's a lack of trust. So ha happiness is connected to happenings, yeah. that you're always in happy yeah. things. It's not always going to be happy in our life. No. Because when Man United lose, you're not happy. I'm not happy. <laughs> but you can still be joyful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. <laughs> So, so, you know, when Man United loses, I struggle. And I sometimes go to the scriptures. Should I rather cut my arm off so I can enter than, than, than feel like I'm feeling? But the, the key there is being joyful. Yeah. And it's, it's a command here to be joyful in all circumstances. Yeah. And the problem is that many in church literally look like coming to church <laughs> is like every Sunday is a funeral. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, the sermon went on for too long. It's like, how can this be? <laughs> like, literally, it's just the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. Because church must be 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Otherwise, I don't want to be there. And people just look like, oh. Yeah. You know, we find things to moan about that are necessary. And sometimes it happens. Even in our lives, we are ungrateful. And we're going to get to that. So be joyful. And then pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, which is a well-known passage. Mm -hmm. And, and what, it mean, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? You can't be praying with your eyes closed when you're driving. Mm -hmm. It won't be clever. Mm -hmm. What it means is to be on a constant fellowship yeah. connection with mm -hmm. God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is about fellowship with God. It's communion with God. That as believers, we are in a constant state of prayer. Now, yeah. I also want to highlight this. I don't want this to be awkward. Like, I find it awkward sometimes. When, when I'm having a conversation with someone about any, anything, they was like, okay, let's, let's pray about it. Now, it's important to pray together. I love yeah, that. Yeah. But you don't have to pray about every single thing. Like, I've got a flat tower, tire. Let's pray about it. Now, yeah, that might seem very spiritual, but it's 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 not what pray without ceasing no, means. No. Because God doesn't care about my tire. But like, isn't it to see your flat tire in the light of God's? Yeah, soul. you can do it, but that's not what they do. Lord, let me pray. The, the tire, you know, it just becomes awkward. So don't feel that when you're speaking to people that you're not human, a human being. It says, let's talk about the issue. And if there's a real issue we need to pray about, please let's pray about. You don't have to feel always you have to. Be awkward. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. But it needs to be the fact that when we wake up in the morning, before we go to bed at night, throughout the day, we are in a constant focus yeah. on the Lord. Yeah. That there's nothing that we are doing that contradicts our Christian walk. No. And that if we do something or say something that we shouldn't have, that we are repentant about, we should. Yeah. So if you feel like, mm, you know, I just didn't handle that situation properly. Mm. I thought, look, Lord, please help me to be focused in this. And that's still been a constant focus on prayer yeah. because of what's happening currently in your life and that's important yeah. and then maybe a, a good reminder is if i've said something i shouldn't have said but i've done something i shouldn't have done whether that's to someone in the church outside the church or whatever i prayed about it, then i need to restore that it doesn't mm. help i just pray to god and say lord no. you know i really spoke disrespectfully to my wife or my husband lord please forgive me it's wrong and then leave it there no, you pray and then you go and sort it out with the person. God's not your little um, secret yeah. talk, and then it's like, okay, that's no, fine. It's, it's, not fine that, yeah. it's not fine with that. Not fine with that person. No. You pray about it and say, Lord, please give me the strength to rectify this, and you go and speak to the person and deal with it. 
I mean, you know, because of course the Catholics mm. get this distorted kind of with their confession. It's because mm. it's almost the image given off that yeah, you go, you yeah. go, the, get, that's it. It's all done. It's kind of absolved. Yeah, yeah, it's absolved. No, yeah, we, we need to go and restore the situation yeah. with the person because I've prayed about yeah, it yeah. and the Lord strengthened me. The Lord's helped me. I know He's forgiving me. I want to. I need to apologize to you. I'm sorry for how I spoke, yeah. how I reacted whatever and you know and that person must be gracious enough to accept an apology because mm. it as it's as important to give an apology as much as it is to accept the apology and then verse 18 is important because rejoice always pray without ceasing see it's a mindset mm. of fellowship and worship and then verse 18 and everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus for you so the christian and the believer must be in that place where we rejoice, we are prayerful in our daily life, we are constantly in communion and fellowship with God, and in everything we give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And here, in the notes, I just said that thankfulness should always be part of our Christian character, yeah. because we have much to be thankful for. Yeah. Mm. And we're not as thankful as we should be. And what's so interesting is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, you can turn there with me. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, I find this very interesting. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. So you look at verse 1, it says, But, but know this, then the last days, perilous times yeah. will come, difficult times. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, mm -hmm. unthankful and unholy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we could say every generation has this. That's what makes the Bible amazing. That you can look at the second century, you'd be able to pinpoint this. I totally get that. So it's not saying, oh, we're living in the end times based upon this passage, because that would be not true. Because it's always, people have always been like yeah, that. Yeah. But the characteristics are just clear for us to see. Yeah. And the key is, I'm thankful we've never had a generation who've had more. No. No. And have no. been as unthankful about what yeah. they have. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, and you, you can, you are, I've often heard you sort of relate to tell us, which is good actually, because you come from South Africa, where, you know, things are like so much better in lots of ways here in England than South Africa. And, and, and actually, you know, we berate, and, and it's like, it's good to recognize that we, we are as a society going downhill, there is less freedom. But the reality is when you compare us, not with just other countries, but with cultures in the past, mm. yeah, there is so, so much that we, you mm. know, Definitely, yeah, yeah, more, yeah. more than we've ever had. And we should still be thankful and that, that we do largely still have a lot of and, and, and especially for us as Christians, be thankful. <clears throat> because the fact that we can gather, yeah, the fact yeah, that we can yeah, worship, yeah, yeah. absolutely, is, is a blessing. Let's enjoy that blessing. Yeah. It's important. So, so, yeah, so the key, yeah, when you look at verse 16, 17, 18, I think those go together. Well, those sort of statement verses, I think they go together so that we rejoice always. If you're rejoicing, you're going to be, who are you going to rejoice to? To the Lord. You're going to rejoice. And in that, you're going to be praying without ceasing. Why? Because you've got a lot to rejoice about. And then also, you're going to pray without ceasing. Why? Because in everything, you're giving thanks. And then Paul takes on a different level now in verse 19. Mm. And it says, do not quench the spirit. Now, in the original word, it basically means that to basically to douse or to suppress. That's what it means. So do not quench the spirit. Now, what happens is if you if you if you've been involved in more charismatic yeah, type of yeah, churches, yeah. they love this. Yeah. This is like their favorite. It is. If anyone in church questions the person that's just been convulsing and foaming at the mouth during the song, then what happens is you are, if you question that, then you are quenching the spirit. I mean, that's <laughs> just insane. Like anything must happen as long as yeah. there's a Jesus statement made or as long as, 
you know, the people are look yeah. sincere and they sing about Jesus, then anything can happen in the church, even if it's absolute mayhem and chaos. And anyone that stands in the church and questions it is that quencher. Um, I remember I was 12 years old, I'll never forget it. 12 years old, my Sunday school teacher was a lovely lady, really nice, she was fantastic. In my old church, it was a Pentecostal church, and it was, I was 12 years old, I was sitting in the service, and a week before, a weird group came in and did some singing and some weird stuff was happening. I think it was sort of like the, so I was 12 years old, so that was 94. So they were also doing some sort of, um, you know, uh, this was related to the Toronto, Toronto stuff slash it, yeah. yeah oh, so they were doing the time, they yeah. were doing some stuff. It yeah. was just weird. It was a Friday evening, I remember. Yeah. And the Sunday, so it was a Friday. Sorry, it was a Friday that happened on Sunday morning. My Sunday school teacher and her husband. Her husband was a bit of a strange character. He used to wear his suit and his hair was just. It was super old school, um, and she was lovely. And they weren't that old, but they looked old school. Um, and then uh, the three kids. And I remember distinctly in the service, the minister opened the service. And they started singing, and something happened in the service. And in the service, he stood up, and he said to the minister in front of everyone, what's happening here is not of God. This is not God. Mm. I remember him taking his wife and his three children, and they walked out of the church. Mm. And I remember the thought I had in my mind was like, oh, these people are just now, they just want to try and quench what's happening. That's what I thought as a 12 year old because everyone yeah. sort of brainwashed. Yeah. But what they did was correct. Yeah. Because what was happening was not of God. But it, again, this term is being used. But what people forget is that they don't read verse 20. Mm. If you look at verse 19 and 20 together, so the word quench means to extinguish or to douse or to suppress. So Paul is saying, don't suppress the work of the Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. And how do you do that? You do that by verse 20. Because it says, do not despise prophecies. Now, immediately when you say prophecy, yeah. people think it's mystic men or <laughs> it's people telling the future. That's not what prophecy is. Yeah. Prophecy is preaching. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's preaching is because the New Testament hasn't been written yet. Has it? Wow. Yeah. Everyone that preached on a Sunday prophesied. Because they would reveal new truth. God would inspire certain people in the church to preach. And they would preach from the Old Testament, yes. But they would also preach expounding on certain thoughts that are now going to establish the New Testament. So they were prophets. Because a prophet speaks for God. The prophet spoke God's word that has not been written yet. Once the Bible is complete in the book of Revelation and everything's complete and it's done, you don't need prophets. You now have preachers. You don't have a prophet because the word is complete. But when the word is not complete, you have a prophet. So here, look, look at the key here. So I get super excited because we never read the verses. Do not quench the spirit. It has nothing to do with charismatic, crazy no, stuff that happens no. in church. People fall over convulsions and start barking like dogs and cackling like hens. It's not talking about that. What it's saying is, if you stop the preaching of God's word yeah. and you despise the preaching of the word, what is that going to do to the work of the spirit? Yeah. Because how does the Holy Spirit work? Mm. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. Sanctify them with your truth. Thy like word is truth. John 17, 17. Yeah. The preaching of God's word is how the Holy Spirit works in the hearts and the minds of people. People are saved through the word of God. God calls us to preach the word. Through the preaching of the word, the Holy Spirit does his work. In the church, when the pulpit is restrained, when the minister is not allowed to preach God's word, when God's word is not preached faithfully, you are quenching the work of the spirit. Good question I've got on that, um, Kenneth. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, everything fully on board with, but would we, um, when... when with this word prophecies here, yes. is there something in the Greek that tells us it's not talking about like, um, you know, foretelling the future as opposed to... I haven't looked at the Greek words, I can't tell you. Can't you. But okay. if you look at the timing of when it is said, right. in comparison, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. I 
you know, kind of looked at the whole yeah, yeah. And if you could look at First Corinthians 14, what is the context of what's being said to what I'm saying? It's very simple. Yeah. Then in First Corinthians 14, it says, rather prophesy than speak in tongues. Why? Because when you prophesy, the person that's an unbeliever that's in this fellowship and the yeah. fellowship itself will hear and then repent. They're not repenting because you told the future. They're repenting no. because of God's word. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, so yeah, God's yeah. word is being preached. That's the power. Yeah. Not being able to tell people's future. No, and no. so what's happened is this whole thing, and I don't want to, I want to be very careful not to seem like we are, and please don't misunderstand. <laughs> I'm not questioning people's sincerity. I'm not saying. I'm not no. questioning their love for the Lord. I'm not questioning the fact that people are saved. In various churches, no. they are. That's what I'm saying. But I'm asking, is it possible that our concept and things that happen in church is molded and shaped based upon a faulty premise in yeah. the beginning? Yeah. So that when it comes to prophecy, and people have read First Corinthians 14, they are yeah. thinking that what prophecy is, is if someone comes into the church, the person in the front says, God has told me this about mm. you. Mm. Yeah. And because I now know something about you, that is a sign that God is speaking to that person. Therefore, then that is what they will do. They will say, oh, God is here. I need to repent. Based upon a faulty understanding of First Corinthians 14. Yeah. Because it is about the preaching of God's word that brings about salvation. It's about the preaching of God's word that will bring about um, uh, repentance. That's why Paul is saying in the church, it's the preaching of God's word that is preeminent to you being able to speak in the language of the person that just come into the church. It's more important to preach the word because the word is powerful. And would you use the scripture where it says prophecy is not for private interpretation to back up what you just sort of said? Yeah, but yeah, hundred percent it is because yeah. when someone is speaking to you, you have to then what did the Bereans do? Look at uh, you know I've got an email. Got, yeah. where you've got testing yes. things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah next one. So what the Bereans did was they heard what Paul said and looked at the scriptures to see if it is so. So when it says no part, no prophecies for private interpretation, you can't just say when someone speaks, oh, well, I think it's good because it's good for me. No. no. Does it match? <clears throat> so what's happened is in this whole conversation, yeah. especially with those brothers and sisters in Christ who are continuous or who are pushing for more sort of yeah. charismatic style gift, what happens is we are drawing from our concept of certain things and then pushing it in. Same as tongues. Yeah. You know, to open the can of worms with tongues. It's a very simple thing, really. Because mm -hmm. when you look at tongues, biblically, in Acts chapter 2, they were languages. Yeah. If that is your premise, every single time tongues are used, it is languages. You'll be able to interpret all those passages very easily. But the problem is that many sort of more charismatic folk will acknowledge that at Pentecost, yes, it was languages. But then it changed. And I'm asking, when did it change? No, Paul then says yeah. in 1 Corinthians 14, this is, yeah, but you're basically basing that on your concept of a subjective experience you've seen in church. If you are consistent in your biblical interpretation, you would take Acts 2 as your blueprint and then follow through all the texts that speak of tongues, base it on Acts yeah. chapter 2. But because people don't do that, what's happened is over the past, and especially for the last 150 years, so to speak, People have thought, okay, tongues must be this language or this heavenly tongue that's spoken in church. Then from there, that creeps into a theological seminary. The person then in front teaches this, and the ministers become equipped in that thinking, but it's not actually what the basis is originally. The same with prophecy. Were there prophets in the Old Testament? Yes. What did they prophesy? They prophesied God's word and what would happen in the future, 100%. But it's all things that would be recorded and be God's word. So when Daniel spoke, when Isaiah spoke, when Elijah spoke, these people spoke and it was recorded where? In scripture. It becomes God's word. Yeah. The same is in the New Testament. You had the apostles who would write down, but you had people on a Sunday who would preach and proclaim God's word. Those truths will then be cemented in scripture because they are being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Oh. Oh, what's happened? <laughs> okay, this stuff. Oh, I can't spell. We sent text. Yeah. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah. Kenneth, can you hear us on Zoom? No. You're the host now, we lost the connection. <laughs> we'll, we'll send him a text. What is going on? Oh, oh okay. Um, Broadband, broadband down in Mal Baptist Church. <laughs> oh, I can't spell what is a Maori. Mm -hmm. I've sent it to him. Mm. Oh, oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> Stay, stay on, everybody. We'll just see what they do, what happens. Well, I've, yeah. sent Kenneth, I've sent Kenneth a text. Look at this. Look. Everything good, thanks. Take yeah. Oh, here we come. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, <laughs> lovely. That's, that's, that's nice. Come on. <laughs> Can you give him a call then? Ah. We just lost signal. That's it. Sorry. Okay. We just lost signal. Sorry. Oh, it was my hi. I didn't, I didn't put the uh, extension lead all the way in. Oh. <laughs> Another learning curve. Okay. So does that make a bit of sense about the prophecy yeah. and times oh, issue? Yes. And what's so beautiful is the connection between the two verses. In, in church, if you want to stop the Holy Spirit from working, what you do then is you, 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 you sort of undermine the preaching of God's yeah. word. Yeah. So if you want the Holy Spirit to be at work, you have to be, of course, open to his leading. And the preaching of God's word is where the Holy Spirit really actively works. Why? Because the Holy Spirit enlightens his word. The word needs to be preached and the Holy Spirit then opens yeah. people's eyes to see it. I mean, what's interesting, these two verses, three verses, mm. with the test, I would include testable things in all this as well. Well, they are, um, yeah. You know, because it's all related. Um, but it, this is, these verses are sort of classic examples of where so often we've all seen it probably, where they're mis, people quote them, misapply them. Mm. But how important it is to see, understand these verses in the context, both of the passage itself but also of the time in which it was written that we didn't have all scripture. Exactly. You know, 100%. and if you don't understand, you know, so that's a key, things. it's a key issue for us that when we look at the new Testament, when, when these epistles are written to these churches, the Bible has not been written yet. Yeah. It's not. They've only got the old Testament. What else have they got? This is all new. It's all fresh. Yeah. It's the first century, especially the 30 years of the book of Acts. It's all part of a new <laughs> process. So for people to think that after the first century or go before the first century yeah. is completed, that this is our normal church to what we think, it's not that at all. It's mm -hmm. shaping things for us going forward. And that's where verse 21 then comes in. Because yeah. you see the connection. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the preaching of God's word of prophecies. Test all things and hold fast what is good. Mm. Over there. <laughs> So what's important is that there needs to be the test. Yeah. And how do you test it? You test it based upon it doesn't contradict yeah. the Old Testament, and neither does it contradict the word of the apostles. That's right. That's how you test it. And Because this is, again, a lovely sort of term I, I think we should all seek is it relates to the whole counsel of God. So really, 
that's what you're testing it against, isn't it? The whole counsel of God. How you bring all things together. And you sort of, when you that kind of brought this out, exposited this passage, this is what you've done. Try to bring in all of the scriptures, isn't it? The other day. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, which is the one I quote earlier, but I just want us to read it. It says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, what's good is the fact that I personally, as a preacher, when I'm preaching, I don't mind being questioned. <laughs> it's important. It's important people to question it. But the difficulty is you can't question a preacher based upon Google. <laughs> or you can't question a preacher because based upon my upbringing. I'm not interested in Google. I'm not interested in, in your upbringing or what someone told you in church to teach on this issue. So when you're sitting in church and you don't agree with what's being said, you can ask the question and it can be expounded upon. If you're not happy with that, mm -hmm. then it's fine, but you must go search the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But the problem is there are too many people that have heard something previously and it's secondhand information or you have a concept in your own mind and it's not being posed to the preacher saying, explain this to me, let's look at the mm. scriptures. It is, I don't agree with you because that's not what I was taught when I was younger. I'm not cared what you were taught. I really don't care. I'm asking, is, is it biblical? Mm. So if you want to hold on to tradition and hold on to what feel, makes you feel comfortable, that's fine, <laughs> but that's not church. <laughs> Because we are not here because it was nice to me when you know that that verse really brought me comfort when it was interpreted completely incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So so it needs to be based upon what the truth of scripture mm -hmm. is, and that's why we have to be men and women of God, which means I don't agree with what you're saying, but it's fine. I'm gonna go search the scripture to see if what you are saying is so. Yeah. Otherwise, it becomes a very difficult conversation. You know, I thought this just occurred to me as, as well. It's interesting when you draw from Acts 17, um, it's interesting that for, in our scriptures, we get the epistles, one Thessalonians, two Thessalonians, and it's not one brilliant and one two. Brilliant. There's so much more that because the Thessalonians didn't quite get it right in these areas, so Paul was, was uh, led by the Spirit to write these letters. Yes. That's for our benefit yeah, but today. The, but the Bereans were near Thessalonians. Really, yeah, 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 it was, yeah. So mm -hmm. all the more, but but yeah. there was that kind of because there was perhaps less of I don't know. It says they were fair minded, no, but yeah. but it's for our benefit 100%. that we get the, the epistle to the Thessalonians and not to the Bereans. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, and then continue. So it's a key one. So what we must do is see, see how beautiful this is. So rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Do not quench the spirit. Don't despise the preaching of God's word. Test all things and hold what is hold to what is good. And then through this, so if we're going to be thankful, if we're going to pray without ceasing, if we're going to be constantly in fellowship with God, we are going to be open to the preaching of his word, the work of the spirit through his word. What then will happen? Abstain from every form of evil. So the instruction is there to abstain, but you're also going to be able to abstain when you are constantly in fellowship with God and open to God's right. word. When we are not, when we aren't praying as often as we should, if we're not worshiping and we're not in in communion with God, we're not open to His word. What will be the result of those two things? Evil. Hmm. So if we want people to live godly lives, if we ourselves want to live godly lives then we have to walk in the spirit, which means to be in communion with God, to be open to his word, to allow his word to speak to us, then it's a lot easier to abstain from every form of evil. It seems to me, even in recent times, we've seen so many examples of not getting caught up in the world, isn't it? And it's kind of, mm. you're in constant fellowship. You, 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 we be, you discern stuff that that's in the world that's trying to yeah 100 100 and what's key is is, is what we're gonna, verse 23 then links in again it's beautiful 
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So through walking in the spirit and being rejoicing always and that rejoicing is not being happy about stuff. It's about rejoicing in God's work in him. We rejoice always. We pray without ceasing. We give thanks in everything. We don't quench the spirit's work by not reading the word, despising the preaching of it. If we don't, if we continue then to test all things, then we can abstain from evil. When we abstain from evil, that is our sanctification. Not so. Yeah. Because your sanctification is yeah. God's work in your life to make you more holy or righteous or more into his image. So the more that you pray, the more that you read the word, the more that you dwell with the Lord, the more that you test all things to see if this is so, the more then you can abstain from evil. The more you abstain from evil, the more you live a sanctified life. So the more, the world. yeah. And the more that you are sanctified, then the spirit and soul in body, the full you then is sanctified. And then we are being molded and shaped and prepared that when Christ returns, we are in a better state than when he saved us. That's what it is. Now, is it, will that happen to every Christian? Might not. But God's will and God's work is to make you better than when, than when he found you, so to speak. And that comes again. And look at the beautiful dynamics here from verse 16. To 23. What is the sanctification? The sanctification is God's work in your heart, your soul, your body, your whole being to become more Christ like. So, is there a physical aspect to it? Yes, there is. Why? Because your physical body manifests what's happened in the heart. Because mm. if we are living unrighteously, it's a sign that something is wrong in our hearts. So, the key is before we just write people off because they're living or they're committing sin. You've got to ask, how's your relationship with the Lord? What is happening? We're going to ask that question. Hmm. All we're interested in is that people live a better life. It's like, hmm. That's a waste of time. It's not what it's about. It's about where you at spiritually, because where you at spiritually will manifest in your life. Because, the, because, because this is key. And I've got some verses here, which is very, very important. I think we're going to deal with that in verse 24. Yeah. So look at verse 24. It says, he who calls you is faithful will also do it. So Philippians 1 verse 6, the good work that God has started, he will mm. complete. That's a promise. But let's look at the sanctifying work. Let's look at Romans 8, 28 and 29. And then 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. So let's look at Romans. Romans 8, 28. So 828 says, and we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The key there is that God's determining purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of his son, which is your sanctification. That God's purpose is that he will take the believer and mold and shape him to be more Christ-like. In word, in deed, in life. And he's given us everything to be able to achieve that, if I can use that term. And then also 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, which we have looked at previously. Look at verse 3 here of 1 Thessalonians 4. For well, this is the will of God, what? Your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. Because God wants to work in us. He wants to work through us. He molds and shapes us to be more godly and more holy for his purposes. And his purpose there is for us not to live ungodly lives. So if someone is living an ungodly life and then... Is still a believer, they are not fulfilling God's will. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love them, doesn't mean that they're not saved. It just means they are rejecting what scripture says. The scripture says we must live.
godly mm. lives. And that doesn't come from your power. It comes from God's work. So if I'm not living a godly life, it means that I'm suppressing God's work. I'm so-called, like we said, quenching the Spirit's work. Through, I'm not hearing God's word. I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to work. And I'm being stubborn. Mm -hmm. But God is working in us. And his will is for us to be sanctified. So that's ultimately, if we look at the church, and this comes back to the church. If we look at the church as a whole, and I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking about the church. But if you're standing on the platform as I do on a Sunday, and look at all the people, you look at people, what is the great desire within the church? Is it for us to do more stuff? in the community? Is it for us to have more people? Is it for us to achieve great things? What is the great focus of the church? What is the desire? Is that God's people become more like mm. him, more sanctified? That is the purpose. Yeah. Because the more godly we become, the more that that will flow out into many churches. Look at the church saying, our first and primary purpose here, we need to grow the church. We need more people to come. That's not the primary purpose of the church. The primary purpose of the church is God's will, which is your sanctification. To be more like him. And that's what Paul drives home in this. And therefore he concludes, just with this conclusion, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with the hope. That's also a bit of an awkward one there. I mean, uh, <laughs> I saw Henry this morning. As much as I like him, I'm not going to greet him with a holy kiss, Henry. <laughs> um, but again, that's a Mediterranean or yeah. you know, ancient mm -hmm. way of greeting. Yeah. You know, people still do it. The Italians tend to do it. They just must stay away from me. Um, I don't want to kiss kiss blokes. That's not what I want. <laughs> Beards touching. It's just awkward. Okay. Um, but it just means greet someone fondly. Yeah, and this is important to me as well. And I never, again, I've been part of church, part of big church, part of church my whole life. But, but, but the whole COVID thing has really made me think about this. Like, if we come to church and we're not happy to see people, then go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Really, go elsewhere, by all means. And that mm -hmm. day would come, I'm very, I'd be very excited that the biggest giver in the church is not happy and they need to go elsewhere. And say, go elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Because the point is, when we come to church, you must be happy to see God's people yeah. and want to greet them warmly. And it's good to see you. It's good to yeah. be here. And just to see them, no, because they're in the same place that you are. We are in church together. And corporately, we will worship God together. That's what he's saying. It needs to be warm. And we're going to deal with that on Sunday when I speak on preaching and on preaching, on prayer, and deal with biblical prayer. You're going to look at the prayers, how often the Lord prayed for this, Paul prayed for this, for church unity. Not for Christian unity, church unity. He's not interested in Christianity as a whole. No. He's interested in local fellowships. There must be unity amongst us, caring for each other. And truth. Because it's important. <coughs> We're not going to get along with everyone. We understand it. We're not going to agree with everyone. You're not going to be able to share exactly the same thoughts on every single thing, but there must be a warmth of saying we are here for a purpose. We are not here for ourselves. We are here because this is where God has called us to worship together. And there must be that warmth. Mm. It says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So really an important encouragement for us. Mm. as the church and as God's people. Are there any questions from the uh, Zoom folk? I think the only question I have really is there's something I'd be concerned about. Yes. Obviously, in the early days, it must have been more difficult to test the scriptures, test what people are saying, because there are obviously fewer, fewer proofs. As, as Christianity evolved, there'll be more people on a constant uh, uh, theme. Therefore, the test would be easier. But in the early days, it must be very difficult because you don't know who's telling the truth and who isn't. 100%. I think that's good. Can you repeat that to us? So basically, no, think, what, what, no, Keith, no. what Keith asked was it must have been very difficult in the first century to test because you didn't have the full scriptures. No. But that's the key, uh, Keith, to why signs and wonders were so important. 
Yeah. Because the validation of the apostles were vital. Mm. And people would know who the prophets are. People would know. So the signs and wonders were very important. And that's the difficulty today, that if we try and reenact the first century trying to validate something, because you're saying it's easier. Yes, it is easier to test 100%. So why do I want to go back to a time when I'm not sure? Why would a person want to sit in church and have Mystic Meg talk to them when you don't know? And, you know, it doesn't make sense because I have the scriptures in my hand. What more do I need? Why do I need another guy or woman or whatever to come up and say, no, God spoke to me last night. I had this dream about you. How do I know? Yeah. That person can't hand handkerchiefs around. <laughs> you know, so it just doesn't make sense. So what's it going to do? And for you especially, Keith, asking that question as a man who wants, you know, you want your facts in order, 100%, because you want to know what's the source, yeah. where do I go, how do I test this? Mm. I've literally spoken to church ministers and said to them, okay, but how do you know if the prophecy is true? Yeah. Well, we hang around, we get together, we pray about it, we'll see. I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah, it, and if you want to go to a church like that, that's fine. But what it's going to do is create constant insecurity. Yeah. When you can come to a church where the word is preached, everything's in the word. You go to the word. Yeah. Nothing is outside. There's nothing weird happening where someone's mm. out claiming to have a dream about you or an unction from the spirit or whatever. You can't function like that. So in the first century, signs and wonders were important because they validated the yeah. apostles, especially. The apostles also validated the prophets. People knew who those people were because they would be able to expound the scripture. There must have been a way in which they spoke as well and preached that showed that this was supernatural. Right. There were certain aspects to it. So there would have been a way that they could discern, but then also realize that if the person's going off track, that then you would be able to know what that was. It's also interesting with the scriptures because remember, what happens is people don't know the scriptures as well today as they did then, even though we yeah. have the whole scriptures. They mm. would have known what the scriptures said. They mm. would have known the words of Jesus. Mm. And, and therefore, what Paul is saying is his gospel never contradicts anything that has been said previously. And that's important no. because the whole Gentiles being saved, the whole point <laughs> of, of what he says, not anti-Old Testament at all. It's not, nothing, nothing really new. It's just an exposition and a further carry on from that which is very, very important. So, yeah, that's a very good question. And that's why the first century was different. Um, mm -hmm. Keith, it wasn't like a norm. And therefore, we can't live in that place. You can't go back to a Model mm -hmm. T Ford when you have cars now. So mm -hmm. I don't understand why churches want to function in that. I don't really know. I'm guessing. When you don't have to do that, you can just go, well, it's in here. And there we go. It's very simple. Okay. Thank you. Good. I mean, it's interesting as well. It was... Thessalonians, that they, um, when I, I was reading the other day um, about uh, when Paul first went there, he actually went to the synagogue the first three Sabbaths. And so mm. you, whilst Miriam was saying, you know, that it's sort of quite, quite gentle, but clearly there were a yeah. good few Jews amongst them. That, and they, if they were Jewish believers, they would have, they would have known the scripture. They would have, they would have. And they probably started, many times they started the church. Yeah, the Gentiles would then make up bigger numbers, yeah. but the yeah. origin would, would, would normally be, with those from the first century. Yeah. Yeah. Any any other questions? Uh, so when they talked here in that verse nineteen, Kenneth, about do not put out the spirit's fire, was that referring back to Acts two? No. It just means the spirits work. It doesn't say put out the fire; it says quench. So quench just doesn't mean fire. The con so the example is of what you do with fire, but it doesn't link it with the Holy Spirit and fire. So it just says when the work of the Spirit or the, the sort of power of it, don't suppress it. So suppress is actually a better word than, than quench in the context. Of it. It's right. suppressing. It's basically what people do with their conscience in Romans 1. Because if you read Romans mm -hmm. 1, I think verse 19, 20, it says they've suppressed the truth mm -hmm. in unrighteousness. So the better word there is suppressed. I don't like the word with a fire connection because then, of yeah. course, the first thing you're going to think is, is Acts 2 and fire. And also, no. in today's age, they talk about fire tunnels, don't they? No, <laughs> it's no, it's not, I'm talking about that. It's basically what you would do. You would do it to a fire where you would basically cover it and it would go out. So that's just that suppression yeah. of it. That's what it's talking about. Okay. Because, again, the fire concept is once off. 
The Holy Spirit, again, that's where the charismatics are like, oh, they must be fire. They must be yeah, heat. That's it. Mm. I mean, even at, at, at Acts, Acts 2, there was no heat. The fire on their heads produced absolutely no heat, and there was no physical fire. Basically, no. what you could just see was a manifestation of something. They mm. didn't even see fire. They just mm. saw basically... Like, when it said like. Like. So fire. basically, the example yeah. is if you look through a fire when there's, you know, yeah, yeah. when you've got a barbecue, it, 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 it shows <sighs> like there's... It, when the, when it takes up the oxygen mm. and you see the sort of that's what it's talking about there wasn't a flame at all but it's just saying don't put that out don't douse that yeah okay but the problem is they they would use that mm. and that's why they get some yeah. strange man of yeah. crazy stuff okay. yeah always fire no fire safety in some church <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, anyway but bless you um we're going to close in prep i'm going to thank the lord for this time Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that you have shared with us. And we pray, Lord, that you help us, especially mm. in our sanctification, which is very important for us to live mm. holy and godly lives, all for your honor and glory. So thank you for your word today. And thank you for this time together. In your wonderful name we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful thank day. You. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.